is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zanker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Welcome to Take Back Time. This is Penny Zinker, and I'm your host. I'm always looking for people who are thinking and offering different solutions. And today, I'm excited that we're going to talk about productive thinking. As you know, it's important to me since I did a TEDx that's called The Energy of Thought. So I do believe that we can control and direct our thoughts, and so does our guest today, and he's going to give us uh, some scientific proof behind that and some tools and strategies for suggestion. Today, we're talking to Peter Demarest. Um, Peter's one of the world's leading pioneers in science, in the science of neuroaxology, that's brain science and value science combined. He's the author of the definitive book on The Science of Answering the Central Question is the name of that book, and it was written in 2010. He's also the co-founder of Axiogenics LLC. His passion is the application of neuroaxology to personal leadership uh, and organizational development. He and his partners are developers of the VQ Profile Assessment System and a pedagogy for transformation called Neuro axiological cognitive remodeling. Peter's been a coach and a consultant to senior executives and other leaders within global organizations, nonprofits, SMBs, and hundreds of entrepreneurs. He's trained and mentored coaches and therapists around the world in the science and applications of neuroaxology, of the VQ profiling, and of the NCRT. Uh, He's been featured as a keynote speaker at international, national, and regional conferences ranging from the International Coaching Federation, HR, TD, I guess that's talent and development, OD, organizational development, and industry-specific events. So without further ado, Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. It was great to be here. I've been looking forward to this since uh, your gracious and wonderful invitation. Well, thank you. I've been looking forward to this too because today we're going to be talking about productive thinking, right? How to think smarter And that's, I'm really passionate about that aspect is about the energy of our thought was my TEDx and Mm -hmm. to really understand how we think and how that impacts everything that that we do. So before we get into that, how did you get into this? Like, why, why are you so passionate about this? Well, so I have to take you back to 1972. I show my age, but I was in 10th grade and I found myself sitting outside the principal's office. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, I got caught doing something I shouldn't have been doing on school grounds. I did inhale, (laughs) uh, just to give you a hint. (laughs) And uh, hey, 10th grade, 1972, it was a good time. But I was sitting outside waiting to go in to talk to the principal. And the, what we called then the school secretary, came in with this poster that she hung up on the wall. And it turned out that it was the brand new United Negro College Fund slogan that they had just come out with. Almost everybody that's anything over the age of 40 or 50 probably knows what it is because it starts with a mind is a Horrible terrible thing to, thing to waste. That's right, yes. Now, in that moment, I thought that was pretty funny because I inhaled. I was <laughs> wasted. <laughs> but that whole idea, I, I mean, I sort of sat back and thought about it and I thought about it later on. In fact, the principal and I had a little conversation <laughs> about the mind, not relevant to the uh, poster itself because I didn't even know it was there. But I also realized that that was really peer pressure was what had me doing it to start with because I wanted to belong and be cool and all that sort of thing. And I later found out that I was pretty much allergic to it anyway. So, But that whole idea that the mind is a terrible thing to waste just really, really stuck with me. And it's not that I pursued it as a career for the first 25 years of close to 30 years of my career, but it did inform all the things that I was kind of doing in it. It was an area of curiosity and sort of avocation. What is success? What's motivation? Why, does, why do people do different things and make the choices they make? 
And it wasn't until the late 1990s that I was involved in technical education and realized there was plenty of evidence that the field of education wasn't putting out enough people that knew what was needed at the time in terms of computer programming. We had Y2K going on. We had the internet was starting to boom. Technology was changing so fast that teachers couldn't keep up with it. Right. And if teachers couldn't keep up with it under the instructional model of teacher as expert, then the students weren't learning what they needed and literally couldn't get and hold jobs. And it dawned on me that, that the problem wasn't about the learners. It was about the teaching methodology. So I started to think, oh, what could we do different and how can we do it better? And the whole concept of critical thinking and the mind. And I had been exposed to this crazy thing called coaching, you know, back in the 90s and realized, well, what if we could turn the teachers into coaches rather than experts and support them with training on how to do that and curriculum that they could use that would enable a student, even a high school student, to become certified in, uh, at the time, Microsoft computer programming. So we set out to do that. Uh, I was the head of a division of a company that did that, and, uh, and it was very successful on a, on a national scale, and we ended up selling it uh, back to Microsoft. But at the same time, my wife was diagnosed with what turned out to be terminal breast cancer, mm. re-diagnosed, I should say, metastasized. And that was a real wake-up call, and I had sort of caught the bug of, of the coaching industry, but I wanted something that was more objective, more scientific, was more than just a conversation like, well, what do you want to talk about? And I saw the power of a structured approach to learning and development, such as what we did in the IT world. And so I left the corporate world to start a company and around that same time discovered the science of axiology. axiology. Uh, you can Google it. What is yeah. that? It, I mean, people probably previewed you, looked in the, the science of axiology, like, what is that? Right. So it comes from the Greek word axio or axia, which means worth or value. And it dates back to Plato and Socrates as a philosophy. And it's the philosophy of what is good, what is bad. It gets into morals and ethics and value and uh, valuing. And in the mid 1900s, a Dr. Robert Hartman, who you can also Google, Robert S. Hartman, is credited with being the father of formal scientific axiology. He applied scientific methodology and mathematics to the question of what is good and what is value. And it turns out he discovered that there actually is a structure to how value is created and destroyed in the universe and in the world and in our human experience. But he also recognized that in human experience and in the human mind, it's highly subjective. So it's an interesting thing like, well, how, do, how can you make something so intangible and seemingly subjective and turn it into something tangible and objective. And that's what Dr. Hartman did. And didn't he do, I, I'm remembering now that uh, he did a, like a test, a values test. Yeah, not a values, but a value. A uh, value. So yeah, it's called the Hartman value profile. And it's a way of measuring, let me take one small step back. One of the things that Dr. Hartman discovered is what's called the hierarchy of value. And the hierarchy of values says that there is a structure, as I mentioned before, and part of that structure, for example, proves that the intrinsic value of people, the human being, is infinite. And uh, anything with infinite value obviously has more value than anything that isn't of infinite value, right? Right. But he didn't just prove that. He also gave us an understanding of why, 60 years later, people are starting to realize that when you when an organization puts the intrinsic value of its people ahead of all else, you'll see dramatic increases in performance and productivity and engagement, et cetera. In fact, Dr. Hartman pegged it at 40% on average. And organizations like Great Place to Work have documented how powerful that is, although they don't know about axiology. In my research of applying sort of meta, what are the measurements that Great Place to Work uses? It turns out there are metrics that show that the organization operates in high alignment with the hierarchy of value. And those organizations dramatically outperform the standard and poor's. So there's some, a lot of, you know, real good data around that. What Dr. Hartman created was also an assessment called the Hartman Value Profile Assessment Instrument that helps a person or we're able to identify what your personal value hierarchy is. And then we, we match those things up. We look at how much in alignment is your thinking, 
how you judge and, and perceive things and judge things and the meaning that you make of them, not just the meaning, but the value that you place on them compared to the objective hierarchy of value. And there's an enormous amount that we can tell. In our and application, we call it. I have to just interrupt here because I took it and yeah. it's like these are really like weird questions. So if you've ever taken a personality profile, and I'm going to ask you in a minute mm -hmm. what's the difference between the two, you know, um, mm -hmm. they're questions that you can kind of, you could infer what they're trying to get at. So therefore, there's also a, a problem with that because if you want to sway it, right, you can answer it uh, any which way. But these were like not. I was like, wow, well, these questions are kind of weird. And I think you rank them on a, from one to yeah. 20 or something like that. And so it's, they're just, he came up with these to, to match them. So this is my personal value based on these things and they get matched. So I'll let you finish what you were saying. And then I want to come to understand what's the difference between a personality profile and a value. Sure. sure. So it's not really measuring your values as in moral and ethical values, right? It's measuring how you value things. Right. Right. In fact, in your TEDx talk, I think you said, and I wrote it down here, it's not just, or I wrote down something you were talking about, the meaning that we give to, to yes. words and the power of them, but it's not just the meaning that we give to words, it's the value of the meaning of the words, like relative to us. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing, right? So it's not just the definition of those words or the story that's behind the words, it's the meaning, the value that we give to the story that we make up about those words. Right, and, and that's what and creates so, the meaning. In my view, right, it would be yeah. like, let's take something like, let's take an example so that people can, can really relate. If I'm saying somebody said they couldn't relate to me, right? So I could interpret that in a couple of different ways. And so I think that what I value, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or whatever, right? But this is my perception that, that what I value will dictate which meaning I choose. So uh, I've got a couple different meanings. Okay, it could that's the way mean, to put it. Sure. It could mean if somebody doesn't relate to me that they say that. It could mean that they come from a different background and they see they have a different opinion or a different view. Mm -hmm. It could mean that I said something that put them off, that they can't relate mm -hmm. to me, right? It could have like a lot of different meanings. It, it could mean that they didn't understand what I was saying. Mm -hmm. So if I took the perspective of looking at what all it could mean, what I value is going to then determine where I head with that. Is that right from, from the yeah. science and the way that you're thinking? Yeah, the semantics sort of create this unfortunate circle or circular thing, right? Because then it's the meaning of the meaning that you gave to the meaning, right? <laughs> Which could be all kinds of things, as, as you said, you left one out, and that is that they're an idiot for not relating to you, right? <laughs> right. Some people would go that way. <laughs> or I'm an idiot because one. I can't relate to them. I can't figure out how to make that right. connection. So, right, and, and, yeah. and people go to those places, right? They'll go to oh, them absolutely. Themselves, beat themselves up and say, I must be an idiot that they can't relate to me. I think it's important, and when we're talking about this idea of thinking productively, is how we also support people that have sabotage thinking and how they can oh, yeah. shift that. So I want to go in that well, direction. Well, yeah, we'll definitely get to there. So back to the assessment instrument. Actually, you said there were questions on it. If you think about it, there were no questions on it at all. They were they statements, were just, right? They were statements, right. And it is the meaning making that we give those statements and the relative value that would have a person rank them higher or lower, right? And that's exactly how it works. And it's been scientifically validated for 60 years or so. We at Axiogenics have a, have a, a way of a of interpreting those results that's greatly informed by neuroscience, which is why our branch of the science is what we call neuroaxiology, because it's so informed by modern neuroscience and cognitive sciences that would, Dr. Harbin didn't have back in the 60s, and he passed away in 1973. So we're able to measure is what we call your cognitive assets or your best ways of thinking and your cognitive biases, which become your liabilities that are those things you alluded to a little bit before that sabotage us. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when it comes back to productivity, right? Biggest killer of productivity is our less than good ways of thinking. Yes. That we also know dominate 85 to 95% of all of our thinking and emotions and choices and behaviors and reactions. 85 to 95%. 85 what to 95% is what? Is, is impulsive. Of the time. We are, well, of our behaviors, of our choices, our actions and emotions and everything is dominated or dictated by 
even at a subconscious level, our less than best biased ways of thinking. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay? Which means we're only actually at our best about 5 to 15% of the time. That's wow, it. that's depressing. <laughs> well, here's the good news. If you added another 5 to 10% of that, right. <laughs> you could double your effectiveness. So maybe that's like when they say that we only use a part of our brain, that maybe it's, it's kind of related to that, right? If we only use and we're focused on the assets, right, and the best parts, imagine. Right. We, we got to 50%. Yeah, we're always using significant portions. I don't believe the old 10% thing like we used to get. The question, But what is more accurate is we're only using the best parts of it about 10% of the time. Just the best parts of it, right? And the rest of the time, not so good. Now, there's biological reasons for that, too. The brain develops habits of mind because it takes a lot of physical energy to think consciously. And so a lot of our thought processes are habit driven and essentially so, because if you actually had to think about every single little thing, right. you'd be exhausted, right? We just couldn't do that. So by habituating so many things, it leaves that uh, reserve of energy available for conscious thinking. The problem is a lot of our subconscious meaning making also informs our conscious thinking and we don't even know it. And there's been so many, I'm sure you've seen some of the studies about conscious biases or unconscious biases. And even just, there was this one study that was really fascinating. I, that's why I remember it. Of They did a study of bringing a whole bunch of people into a, a conference room and they would sit them down at one end of the conference room. It was like a, eight to 10 people. And they would have them engage in discussions about how to solve some sort of problem. And they did multiple groups. And the only difference between the groups was in half the groups, they had a briefcase like a formal old-fashioned briefcase sitting at one end of the table, just sitting there. No words about it, nothing. It was just sitting like somebody left it there. And then the other half, they had a backpack sitting on the end of the table. Okay? And what they discovered was that in the rooms where it was a briefcase, the people took a much more authoritative, needing to be right, less collaborative approach than the groups where there was a backpack in the room. That's really interesting. It represented essentially how formal was the meeting going to be versus informal. And people tend to be more friendly and open and collaborative in informal settings than they do in formal settings. And the only difference was the object sitting in the room. Okay? Wow. And the subconscious meaning that they gave to that. Yeah. yeah. So there's been many, many, many studies about how powerful these are. So the other thing that we've uh, discovered after diagnosing the thinking of tens of thousands of people is that that 85 to 95 percent of the time is is dominated by what we're able to measure as cognitive biases that become our liabilities and that they are almost always what we call self-centric, meaning their primary focus is on what's in it for me. How do I get what I want? How do I protect myself? How do I get my way? What's in it for me? W-I-I-F-M, right? Right. Yeah. Everybody's familiar with that. Everybody is. That's right. And we don't even realize that what's really fascinating is that even things that we think are not that, like, oh, I'm going to help this person. When you get down to what's motivating a person to offer help, it's because oftentimes their own self-esteem requires that they be helpful because they want the reward, the thank yous, and the pat on the back or the recognition. Right, it makes us feel that somebody owes them a favor. Yeah. Yes, but a healthy person doesn't need that. Well, I don't know. I mean, we could... I don't say they don't want it. They don't need it. They don't. And and that's the need is the important thing. Gotcha. Right. If I need to feed the hungry in order to feel good. Right. Some people are filling a hole. They need that to to feel whole versus it would be nice to to feel good about it or recognize it or whatever. Yeah. And statistically speaking, by the way, about 83% of all coaches we've ever worked with have that issue. Right. Well, I'm not surprised because they do say people teach what what they need as well, right? Like I do a lot of work around time management But the truth is, is I'm extremely disorganized and can get all over the place. So I have to put structures in place to keep me focused. Of course. So it's an adaptive adaptive thing. So yes, and I've met many a health coach who was not healthy. And so, yes. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I don't want to imply that being helpful is a, is a bad thing. But there's a dynamic that often occurs that when we need it really bad, sometimes we push too hard to be helpful and it ends up backfiring mm. and we end up not being helpful. Or as we put it, we end up not actually creating value. Right. Despite well, it's, our good intentions to do so. Yeah, I think like you said, it's when the focus is on you, then you're not going to serve at the highest level. The focus has right. to be on on the other party and what they need and what, what their outcome is. Exactly. Yeah. And that, so there's these two mindsets, the self-centric mindset where we're just focused on our own stuff, not necessarily selfish, just Self. What's in it for me? Yeah. And then the other is what we call the value genic mindset. In other words, the focus is on how do I create value? How do mm. I, and not just for me, but for everybody concerned, short and long term, all things considered. And we get to choose between the two, right? Going back to that question or that statement, this person isn't relating to me, right? From a self centric standpoint, it would mean something completely different than it might mean if you're in a value genic mindset. Right. Yeah. Where where you're yeah. focused on how do I create value in this moment when me and this other person aren't actually connecting or relating. Right. right. How you approach that could be completely and likely would be completely would be. different depending on which of the two mindsets you're in. Right. Because the questions we would ask would be different. Right. And the focus that we would come from would be completely different. It's like looking at a window from one angle and what you see and looking out another angle and seeing something right. completely different. There's a bush on one side and uh, a tree in another house on the other side. I just uh, realized, Penny, you were, we got through this because you asked me, how did I get into this? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Um, it's developing a lot. Right. So that's perfect. Absolutely. So, the, so axiology is where my first exposure, but then that whole question that I always had about the mind, and that got me really interested in neuroscience, that people like David Rock were coming out, and Science Magazine, there were so many things coming out about the brain that were showing that a lot of what, the so-called success gurus had bought into and were selling for decades actually isn't, was contrary to what science was finding out. Distractions are the enemy of productivity. Go to distractionquiz.com and find out your distraction profile. Are you a time zombie or a hamster? Take this free distraction quiz today to rate your ability to focus on what keeps you from being a wizard. Go to distractionquiz.com. So when you say the success gurus, like what's an example, not of a person, but of a, a philosophy or a, something that was proven by science not to be true? Okay. At the risk of sounding blasphemous. Do uh, it. Oh, my God. We actually know from science that positive affirmations used to compensate for negative voices in our head actually don't work very well. They work very short term, but we've shown it over and over and over again that, and I can actually show yeah. you thousands of assessments of people who have practiced that, that it actually did damage to their psyche long term. Because they didn't believe uh, it. I think that's, that's what I've always thought, is that if you say something positive affirmation, if you don't really believe it inside, then it's going to negate itself anyway, right? Yes, it does negate okay. it. But if you've got this habitual voice in your head that says something like, I'm not good enough, or I will never be this, that is your belief. And so one of the other things, of course, that have come out in neuroscience is we don't actually multitask. Okay? Right. And these belief right. systems are very deeply held. So... That's right. We just declare for people who are listening, we don't multitask mm -hmm. because we do a task and then we shift our focus to another task. Absolutely. So it, it's more right. the, the lost time and energy that goes from shifting that's the issue, not doing multiple things at the same time because we're, we're not actually doing that. Sure. But there is a um, sort of a, an interesting time gap. You've, you've probably heard the saying, um, what fires together, wires together? Yes. You heard that? Okay. Yeah. Reverse is also true. What wires together, fires together. Right. right? Because they're wired together. Right. The dynamics of, of what often happens with things like positive affirmations to compensate for negative beliefs, particularly, is, oh, I've got this voice in my head that says I'm not good enough. And so we're taught, well, you have to say, I'm great. I'm great. I can do this. And because you're putting those two things into a very tight, uh, you know, almost simultaneous thing, you're actually wiring them together. Ah, interesting. Right? 
And what, the way the brain, the brain works, if you study things like neuroplasticity and uh, synaptic morphology, synaptic pruning, which is the, the younger kids, but what you find out is that the brain physically wires those neurons and those neural pathways together. Hmm. So at some point, you might somewhat bury the negative voice in terms of right. maybe not hearing it as much. But whenever you say the positive affirmation, subconsciously, it's also lighting up the neuron associated with I'm not good enough. But Got you it. may hear it. So it goes, I'm great, I'm great. And your little voice says, no, you're not. Liar, right. liar, pass on fire, right? <laughs> right. No, it makes total sense what you're saying. Yeah. What it I becomes think like a drug that we become addicted to, literally. We become dependent on this right. to keep ourselves going. So, so what's an alternative strategy for somebody who in the past thought that was going to be a positive influence and it's, it's not the, the best way. Yeah. What's an alternative strategy that's value-based? So questions are how we control our own brain. When you woke up this morning, the very first thing you did most likely was to ask yourself a question. Right. Right. What time is it? Do I really have to get up? Is it daylight yet? For some people, it's who's that next to me? Thousands of times a day. Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a believer in that. Depending on the question yeah. you ask is going to shift you in, in completely different directions. Absolutely. So I want to drive the, the point home that we ask ourselves thousands of questions a day. Before you ask me any question in this conversation, you ask the question yourself in some form. Like, oh, I wonder, wonder what he would say to this question, you know, or I wonder how that works. And then you ask the question and, and that moves to different parts of the brain. Okay? Right. So one of the most important questions is what we call the central question. And this comes out of our research that there is a question that underlies virtually everything that we do. And it's based on the recognition that our perceptions and judgments of value is the fundamental driver of the human spirit. You've never done anything in your whole life. You've never made a single decision or taken a single action, made a choice in your whole life that in that moment you didn't think it was the right thing to do. Right. You may discover right. moments later, right. oops, it wasn't. <laughs> that was a mistake. Right. But so, at the moment, you, and it's, it's what we do, it's virtually impossible for human beings to do what they, anything that they aren't able to justify as a good thing. So is it, I've heard different philosophies on this, like Tony Robbins talks about a primary question that we each have our own primary question that drives us. And I kind of also believe that there's a central, like it, there's a, a universal question and that can drive it? What's your... Yeah, well, that's why we call it the central question. Okay. And it's the same for every human being in one form or another. And it's this, what choice can I make and action can I take in this moment to create the greatest net value? Choice can I make and action can I, can I take, take to... In this moment. Oh, in this moment. To create the greatest net value. You create, wow, greatest net value. Now, let me tell you something. We've got to purposely practice that question because it's really long. <laughs> well, yeah. So let me address that a little bit. So people will shorthand it eventually. But, we, you know, we started out talking about meaning, right? You can shorthand it all you want. I certainly do oftentimes. But it's because I also have the fullness of its meaning engraved in my heart. So if right. I say value, I know what that means. So we purposely left the question long to cover all the bases of gotcha. what it takes to answer it. Right. Life is fundamentally about the choices that we make and the actions we take, right? Yeah. We can only make choices and take actions in this moment, not the last moment and not the next moment, but right. only in this moment. this moment. And every moment is an opportunity to make a different choice. Absolutely. Right? And why would we take any, make any choice or take any action? Well, it gets back to the, the self-centric versus the valuogenic mindset. Are we going to put a for me at the end of this question, like to create the greatest net value for me right. or just to create the greatest net yeah. value? And we said net value because it's important to note that every choice and every action does have a cost to it, even if it's just an opportunity cost because we, we're not mm -hmm. multitasking, right? Right. And it's important to be able to consider the pros and the cons for all people concerned and others, and both the short and the long term. So it's a, that net is a little teeny word that means a, a great deal. 
And the truth is we'd have to be all knowing to answer it properly or accurately all the time. What we have found is that human beings are extraordinarily capable of answering the, the question out of their innate wisdom or their higher intelligence or their intuition, if you will, than they ever know, than they possibly could know until they start to really ask the question. Right. We are far cap so capable of answering the question. We just don't ask it enough. That's it. Right. Right. So this is the best and most productive question that we can ask that's going to be highly valuable in comparison to something like affirmations or something like that that are not, right? So just so people understand, this is a, a tool, a resource, a strategy. And also uh, yeah. the, the title of your book, right? The Central Question. And answering the Central Question, right, which gets deep into the science. Yeah, so just asking the question earnestly, right? Like intentionally, not as a rhetorical question and hoping right. the heavens are going to open up or something. But you really have to think about what choice can I make and action can I take in this moment to create the greatest net value. Let me give you an example of it. People who are needing to stay home, they're telecommuting, and they're getting, even if they were at the office, the same thing still happens. You know, you get bombarded by emails mm -hmm. for a whole bunch of different things, and it's so easy to get distracted. It's yeah. easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy to figure out, well, what's the priority? And we sort of get into this machination where we may even just freeze and say, oh, I'm just going to go get lunch. <laughs> I'm going to go get a cup of coffee because I don't know what I'm going to do right now. Procrastination may set in. But if we just take that time to ask the question here, it's even on the back of my business card. Oh, thing. very cool. What choice can I make and action can I take in this moment to create the greatest net value? If you really just think about that, you already know the answer pretty well. Right. We right? just don't do what we know. Yeah. What's important that it is about creating the greatest net value, yeah. no for me at the end of it, though you're included in the, you know, in the evaluation. You know, to think literally means to evaluate, right? And look at the word that's in the middle of evaluate. It's the word value. That's right. That's what thinking really is, is evaluating things, right? So evaluate things in the context of how do we create value? It's also, we call it the central question of life, right? Because the success that we have in life is based upon how the quality of our choices and actions that we take. Absolutely. It's the central question of love, because if a relationship doesn't create value for both people, it's not a very good relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine a marriage where you're actually thinking about how can I create greater value for my significant other, right? Absolutely. And it's also the central question of leadership. Leadership is fundamentally about creating value and oftentimes through other people or helping other people to create value for the organization or for the mission, whatever that may be. So that's the one thing that we want to get out to 100 million people is just ask the question. Yeah. And you're already so much more capable and it'll automatically engage more of that better thinking that you can do and keep yourself, maybe add another 5% onto uh, bringing your A game instead of being sabotaged by, by the biases. When I think it would be interesting to, maybe you've done this already, to interview highly successful people and to identify what questions they ask themselves and, and how they're value oriented. Because I, one of the things when I said, I believe that there's a, a universal question that we all ask, like this question mm -hmm. that you're talking about is one that we can, we can practice, right? And continue mm -hmm. to drive ourselves into one direction. I also believe that we have a universal question that in every moment we ask ourselves. And that goes back to what I said before with how I might interpret it. It's what does this mean? We ask it all the time. We just yeah. don't realize it. It's unconscious. And then if we just take a one step further and ask it a couple times and say, well, what else could this mean? And what else could this mean? That for me has always been value driven to say, which is the highest value meaning I can give this for me and for others, right? So can I give somebody the yeah. benefit of the doubt and ask a question versus get angry at them and so forth? So I believe, and that's just been my practice, and I didn't even realize that that was my practice until I went to a program where they kind of taught this idea of asking this question or any question like uh, Byron Katie does with, is this true? Is this really true? That really opens up our, our perspective and makes those choices to our awareness, right? They make them conscious. They take those choices and make them conscious. And I think that's yeah, yeah. one of the key things. We're not even aware 
of what our choices are. So there's one little thing I might add to that question of what does this mean, and uh-huh. maybe doing it already, is the word could. What could this mean? And by extension, what else could this mean? Exactly. Right? Yes. It's real easy. That's what, uh, if we just ask, what does this mean? And we draw a conclusion. We run the risk of what we call systemic thinking. It's not mm. the same as systemic thinking. Systemic thinking is very black and white. And once we've made a judgment, we think it's the right judgment. But if we take the time to say, well, what else could that mean? Not what does it mean, but what could it mean? It opens us up to being able to look at it from more than one perspective to reconsider because often things take this person doesn't relate to me. Well, that could mean lots of different things. Right. Right. Absolutely. So the question is. One addition to that one word changes the whole, like you said, it changes it so that you are directing the focus. It has the same impact when you ask it several times. So what else could this mean? which is in the second part. But I like, I like what you're saying is added to the first part and there's an implication or an in- inferment that there are other meanings, right? And then that sparks the next question and so forth. So for right. people who are looking to add these practices to make their choices more conscious and to be more productive in their choices and their actions and to create greater net value, these are giving them some real real valuable tools. We're coming to the end of our, so I'm going to, let's make okay. Our last, I mean, we could talk about this all day because this is super fun and interesting for me and, and for you too. But so what would you say as, as closing comments for, for people who are listening? Because there was so much uh, value here in this, in this conversation. So I think if, if I drove any point home, it would be if you, if you take a few minutes to really, and this is to the whole audience, really think back about your life and all of your life experiences. One of the things you're likely to discover is your best life experiences, the the times that were most meaningful, most impactful on you, not just joyful, because sometimes those life experiences aren't joyful, Mm -hmm. but the things that formed your life in, in the most positive ways and the ways that you've been able to use in positive ways in your life are times when someone created value for you or you created value for someone else. It is the source of some of the greatest joys in life is giving. And it's not just about giving like the greatest good and self-sacrificing. We are in this together, particularly at this time of this pandemic and how enormously important it is. Another part of your website talks about stress. And so so what's also interesting is almost all stress, other than physical work stress, but almost all stress is actually comes out of our biases. It comes out of that self-centric mindset. Yeah. It comes out of our perceptions that things are wrong and they're threatening and we're going to lose something or we're not going to get what we want or we're not going to achieve what we want. And it's all this threat response that's where a lot of the stress comes from. Yeah. When you ask yourself the central question and you move into a valuogenic mindset, you will feel the stress melt away. Yeah. And so it helps you be more productive. It allows you to reduce the stress and use the best parts of your thinking and access uh, more of your wisdom and innate abilities, uh, connect with other people, and of course, be more productive, make better use of your time, make better choices around what your priorities are. Because I don't actually believe you can manage time. We only manage our choices and actions, right? Uh, Relative to time or within the time and space and what our priorities are. And I don't know of any other time in my lifetime that collectively being valuogenic and not being self-centric is more important for the future of the human race. And so just ask the question. There are other things that the science allows us to do, like we can measure an individual person's, identify their best ways of thinking, and then teach them how, what questions to ask that will instantly have them engage their actually best ways of thinking. Right. Without having to fake it till you make it or anything like that. Right. Or pretend. Right. Like, I'm a great strategic thinker and they're not, you know. Well, we can actually tell you whether you are or aren't. So you can stop trying to be as much or use other ways of thinking to think more strategically. There's, there's all kinds of really cool things that right. we teach in our self-leadership process. So, but it starts with, with asking the central question. If that's all somebody do, does, then as a result of listening to this, then we've done a good job. Pop up that question again so we can see it on your business card. Sure. So everybody sure. can take it down and, and repeat it. Right. 
What choice can I make and action can I take in this moment to create the greatest net value? That right. is the central question. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. So You're where welcome. can people go to find out more information about you to get your book and check it out? <laughs> there we That's go. That's on the other side of the card, right? Yeah. It's no. a little blurry. Um, so the website is uh, axiogenics.com. It's A-X-I-O-G-E-N-I-C-S dot com. But the other thing that I would invite people to do if they really want to, there's obviously a certain limit to the number of people that I can do this with, but I would invite your entire audience to take the assessment. And I will spend about an hour with them on the phone free of charge, going through awesome. an introduction, uh, a mini version of their report and teaching them how to access one of their best ways of thinking. And in the process of that, when you access your best way of thinking, you automatically, in a sense, disable your biases, yeah. your worst ways of thinking, yeah. and it will instantly make a difference in your life. And so the way they do that, uh, get ready to write down. So they would go to vqprofile.com slash my initials, P-D. I'll spell that out again. V-Q as in value quotient, profile.com slash P-D. P-D. So D as in dog. No, as in debonair, dashing. Oh, excuse me. Debonair and dashing. <laughs> so we're describing you. That, that was a positive affirmation. Oh, and you know, just to forewarn, it is a very different kind of assessment. It knows no questions on it. It's not a personality or behavioral assessment. It's actually measuring how you think, not your behavioral tendencies or your dominant, not even strengths as in strengths finder or as in personality assessments. You know, this is completely different completely. than that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I mean, that's, first of all, that's a very generous offer. So if you're listening, you better jump on that. I, I don't know how many, how many hours he's going to uh, be able to give away. So you want to be one of the first to jump on that and uh, right after me. Uh, so thank you so much for, so, uh, yeah, just one other thing. They'll be able to set up an appointment with me with my online calendar, right? You have one too. Right. So after they take the assessment, there's a button there to do it. And if it fills up, which it often does, then they'll just have to stretch it out into the future. Right. But, but, uh, yeah. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Penny. It was yeah. a real pleasure. Sorry we didn't have more time, but it's a good slice. Absolutely. It's a good slice. And really, you guys got the central question. So you got what you needed. And of course, there's more. Go check it out with, uh, with Peter on his site, vqprofile.com slash PD. And uh, you thank you for being here, investing your time, because what you're learning here is going to help you in the future to take back time. That's working smarter and being more productive with the time that you do have. So my name is Penny Zinker, and this is Take Back Time. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time. <laughs>